listening to Awake Radio. Straight talk to the awake and aware. You're listening to Shaziz Radio, where originality and original music never stop. Isn't that that mad scientist dude? Welcome to Rick Radio. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Welcome to Wake Radio. This is Chrissy McMahon with Alchemical Connections, and I want to say thank you to Vin James for uh, his lovely music. Sorry I missed most of the show, but we want to thank our own Vin James for always being here and presenting uh, the No State Project and other wonderful, wonderful people and information. Uh, I just got on... uh, Shiziz Radio, and uh, I want to thank ShizizRadio.com for uh, allowing us to stream live during the broadcast. I don't like to say simulcast, I just like to say broadcast because we are sister stations, brother stations, brotherly love stations, and thank all the Knights of the Round Table over there, and Shiziz, and especially our wonderful. Uh, administrators and lovely hosts that we have here at wakeradio.co.uk and check out our sister website at wakeradio.us and tonight I have a a desire to continue the Fukushima updates which I started November 18th uh, when TEPCO decided to begin uh, a cleanup at Reactor 4 and uh, as we know, uh, nothing of that magnitude's ever been attempted. So it's uh, quite scary to those people who are actually paying attention and to the rest of us who have no idea about what's going on. Um, we like to continue these updates so that at least we can have a knowledge of what is uh, going on there. So... Um, We're going to continue that in a few minutes. Uh, Thank you for listening. And I want to thank Crazy Horse for being in the chat. And I'll be right back. Good evening and welcome again back. Uh, this is Chrissy McMahon with Alchemical Connections, and tonight is December 29, 2013. Uh, before I start the Fukushima update, I want to give a big shout out to my lovely granddaughter who's five years old today, Harley Harley. Happy birthday, baby. Uh, she was with me until Saturday, and I had to send her home. She was too much for me, but I love her. And I'm so blessed to have beautiful, beautiful grandchildren. And uh, with that thought, I guess that brings me to why I make such an effort to try to have uh, some kind of information about what's going on with Fukushima. I'm really into energy, especially free energy. And I got involved in this because of a guy named Liam Sheff, who is no longer uh, friending me on Facebook. But that's okay. That's another story for another time, but I want to say hi to Bob Face and hi to Crazy Horse, um, two steady listeners who are always here and always chatting and giving good information and sharing wonderful stuff, and we're so grateful to have such loyal listeners at awakeradio.co.uk and also uh, shizizradio.com, so thank you both, Bob Face and Crazy Horse 1. 
for being here tonight. This lovely rainy Sunday. Well, it's more icy here. So I hope wherever you are, you're warm with many loved ones. So as I begin, we're going to go to the ENE News Energy News. Um, this is one of the best websites for Fukushima updates, and it's ENENEWS.com. There's no www anything like that. Um, the first article is steam coming from Fukushima Unit 3 reactor building observed multiple times this week. Well, that would make a lot of sense considering, oh, and there's a horrible picture of the damaged uh, reactor site, so I'll post it here, and you can check it out if you like. Um, TEPCO, December 27, 2013, around 7 o'clock a.m. on December 27th, and confirmed by camera that from Unit 3 reactor building, 5th floor near the center, steam is generated, have not been identified abnormal plant conditions of 54 minutes at 7 o'clock a.m. the same time. The indicated value of the monitoring post meteorological data of 50 minutes at 7 o'clock a.m., 5.1 degrees Celsius temperature, 93.1% humidity. TEPCO translation, December 25, 2013, at around 7 a.m. on December 25th, and confirmed by the camera that from Unit 3 reactor building, fifth floor near the center, steam is generated, have not been identified abnormal plant conditions of 8 o'clock a.m. the same time. The indicated value of the monitoring post meteorological data of minutes at 7 o'clock a.m., 2.8 degrees Celsius temperature, 76.7 percent humidity. And then it goes on December 24th at 7 a.m. December 19th. The camera confirmed that Unit 3 reactor building steam was generated but was not identified as abnormal. And um, then on December 20th we have Gunderson. Nuclear fuel has been moved by groundwater at Fukushima Daiichi. It's time to walk away from the plant for the next 100 years since there is underground sarcophagus. Since there's an underground sarcophagus, much more difficult to contain than Chernobyl, huh? That's an understatement. If anybody understands the ramifications of that comment, I'm not sure who Arnie Gunderson is, but he's the Fairwind's chief engineer. And uh, I'm just going to click on the link so I can give a full detail of the uh, Fairwinds Energy. Um, I guess he's one of the um, posters. He's just an individual who uh, does a blog. But Arnie Gunderson at Fairwinds, Chief Engineer. Um, I would like to uh, get a little bit more information with him as I go to, um, to read through this second article. Um, Fairwinds Energy Education, December 20, 2013, at 1.30 in. At Fukushima Daiichi, the nuclear fuel is in contact with the groundwater because the groundwater has leaked to the bottom of the containment building and it's gotten into other buildings that surround the containment. That makes Fukushima Daiichi much more explosive and expensive to solve, I'm sorry, expensive to solve and much more difficult to contain compared to Chernobyl. Um, yeah, this is a horrendous situation. Night crazy. Is it as bad as they say? Hmm. Well, they have six reactors there, Bog. And, uh, and we will miss you, crazy. Aw, how beautiful. And say a little prayer for me. That's perfect. Say a little prayer for everyone else at this fiction. Uh, let me go back and explain to you a little bit of the situation. There's six reactor reactors at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear nuclear reactor plant, <laughs> and uh, actually they have eight in total. Tefco is responsible for. I'm not sure where the other two are. They're in the same area, or another area in Tokyo. But uh, Fukushima was built on a fault line. It was built. And on the coastline of Tokyo, in line with uh, tsunami uh, threats. I mean, it was built on the coastline. It's 
that sh- in a place where they're prone to tsunamis. I mean, that's probably not the best place you want to build a nuclear reactor, but these are two of the complications with this. So what had happened was there on, I think it was March uh, 2011, they, um, they had a underground earthquake. And what happened was the ground underneath the water, the ocean, um, separated and, and created a tsunami as a result of the earthquake. So the complications from the earthquake combined with the tsunami uh, caused problems. But before any of that happened, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant which is being overseen by TEPCO, that's Tokyo Power and Electric Company. CEO, yep. Um, he, there were cracks in, in the containment uh, tanks. I guess they're not really tanks. So it's all concrete construction and and the number four reactor, which is what they started on November 18th had a containment of over 1,500 spent and unspent fuel rods. So what happens is they use the rods that are sealed with boron and all this other stuff that contain the nuclear fuel that they put into the reactor to heat the water. So what it is, this is a really expensive, really stupid way, and I, I try to be technical here, of heating water and uh, they used the hot water to create the steam to run electricity. Um, we got sold the lie, you know, around the Cotter administration here in the United States. They really pushed nuclear energy as another way to get us off fossil fuels, which really hasn't happened. Uh, I mean, I think we're just as uh, dependent, if not more dependent on fossil fuels, because now, for those people who know or those people who don't know, now we're using natural gas, and they're pushing natural black gas, so that's another fossil fuel. So we really have it, and they're calling it an alternative fuel. They're not calling it a fossil fuel, they're calling it an alternative. So now we have all these things going on, but back to Fukushima. The second article is Gunderson, Arnie Gunderson, who um, I thought that I had punched in his name, but apparently I did uh, I'm going to try to do that right now. Cough. But um, as I was reading that, I, I thought that there was... Um, I know, I, I did something with Arnie Gunderson. Is it Gunderson with an E-N? Yeah, E-N. And it's Artie. So he, um, Arnie, I'm sorry. He's a nuclear expert. And uh, according to Wikipedia, Arnie... Gunderson, okay, it's a little bit slow tonight, uh, is a former nuclear industry executive and engineer with over 30 years of experience who became a whistleblower in 1990. Gunderson questioned the safety of the Westinghouse AP-1000, a proposed third generation nuclear reactor, and has expressed concern about the operation of the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant. He served as an expert witness in the investigation of the Three Mile Island accident and has provided commentary on the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. He graduated of the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute with a BA in nuclear engineering and holds a master's degree in nuclear engineering, gained at the Atomic Energy Commission Fellowship. I'm not sure where that is. He worked at Northeast Utility Service Corporation as a nuclear engineer from 72 to 76 and from 76 to 79 at New York State Electric and Gas as an engineering supervisor. From 79 to 90, he was employed at the Nuclear Energy Services in Danbury, Connecticut, based consulting firm. Gunderson served as an expert witness in the investigation of the 79 Three Mile Island accident. He co-authored the DOE Decommissioning Handbook, first edition in 1981. So this this individual has uh, pretty strong 
credentials in nuclear energy reporting. But I'm not sure. I guess he's a whistleblower now. At Fukushima Daiichi, the nuclear fuel is in contact with the groundwater because the groundwater has leaked to the bottom of the containment building and it's gotten into other buildings that surround the containment. That makes Fukushima Daiichi much more expensive to solve and much more difficult to contain compared to Chernobyl. We all know uh, what happened in Chernobyl. And it, we can review that too as well. I'll just be right with you to uh, to share about that as well. But as we continue, we need an underground sarcophagus to prevent the groundwater from entering the Fukushima reactors. I think once that's accomplished, there's no need to decommission these power plants and turn them back to the to the ground therein. The reason for that is the exposure to young, brave Japanese workers is going to be way too high for almost 100 years. Because of the explosions and because of the fact that the underground water has moved parts of the nuclear fuel out into surrounding buildings, the risks of the workers is way too high. And it's time to contain the groundwater, cover up that site, and walk away for 100 years. The Japanese government doesn't want that to happen because they want their population to think that this is a solvable problem. It isn't. The best thing for the Japanese to do is to admit that they're going to have to live with radioactive rubble at the Fukushima site for over 100 years. Um, there is a, vid a video with this uh, particular article, and I'll post it in the chat room. Uh, you can check it out. It says there's a video there. I don't see it, but um, I did want to uh, get uh, a little bit more information on Chernobyl because I think that's really important. Uh, there was also two other articles here for um, the Chernobyl disaster on Wikipedia. Uh, we also have another article, Epidemiological ep Okay, I'm going to try this one more time. <laughs> I don't think I'm saying it right. Epidemiologist back from Fukushima. We're talking about a sacrifice zone and millions of people live in this area. Exceeds allowable radiation dish for nuclear workers 40 kilometers from the Fukushima plant. And this one also has another video. This was on December 9th. Epidemiologist Dr. Stephen Wayne, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, discusses the human impact of the Fukushima di di nuclear dis disaster based on his visit to the area. This reading here, just to put it in perspective, the guard there, if he stood there for a year, right where he is now in this picture, he would exceed the allowable radiation dose for a nuclear worker out allowable radiation dose for nuclear workers inside the plant and this is 40 kilometers away um, I guess that would be over 100 miles so uh, we're talking about a sacrifice zone and millions of people live in this area so um, so the guard can you see on the ground behind the guard there's a metal plate he's supposed to stand on the metal plate and that's his protection and he's wearing a surgical mask and he has a helmet it's, it's made me feel kind of bad that here is someone that's working in the radiation exposed job and has and he's been issued a surgical mask and a helmet as though he's supposed to feel protected okay and that's the whole article so it's uh, kind of it, it's kind of serious um, it's not a, uh, it's not at all a, an innocent situation. So, um, I just wanted to also check out how far is, uh, oh, 40, uh, 40 kilometers is only 24 miles. I, I'm doubling it. So it's 24.8 miles in, in U.S. conversion. So, so he, you're exceeding the allowable limit within 25 miles 
of the disaster. So, it, and that was on December 9th. So, and then I wanted to go to Chernobyl really quick. The Chernobyl disaster happened in 1986. It was in the Ukraine. I mean, a lot of us, well, it was uh, Russia back in the day, but it's no longer part of the USSR. So, um, he began during a systems test on Saturday, 26th of April. So, here we are, March, I think it was the 11th, was Fukushima. April 26th, 1986, was uh, Chernobyl, and just for the hell of it, Three Mile Island. Uh, I'm going to just punch in uh, Wikipedia. Occurred March 28th. So isn't it interesting? Within a month of each other, these three disasters happened. Uh, the first one was in 1979, 1986, and 2011. So, um, and... We all know that Japan's been just bombarded with uh, nuclear radiation and it just um, doesn't make any sense as to why that continues. So here's the fourth article from ENE News at energynews.com. Engineering. Engineer. Six experts say nuclear explosion at the reactor is possible. NRC Fukushima Unit 3 explosion had three loud banks, much larger than Unit 1 blast. Tokyo professor's presentation adds, question mark, hydrogen explosion of reactor 3, question mark. So this is from the um, May uh, 2000, wait a minute, uh, th these are March 12th and 14th, so this is within days of the original 2011 uh, but it wasn't published until May 15, 2012. So it took over a year for this to be published. Uh, YouTube videos comparing Unit 1 and Unit 3 explosions. Unit 3 much larger. Initiating event and then three loud banks. Chris Gifford to Infrastructure Planning Commission in the UK was PDF Engineer Risk Management Consultant. March 14, 2012. My paper, Fukushima Daiichi, B4, I quoted six authorities who share the opinion that nuclear explosion of fissile material out of control is possible. Sores Mevited, in a preface to the 2011 edition of The Legacy of Chernobyl, describes the Chernobyl explosion as a nuclear explosion. The record shows that Dr. Webbs, who worked on U.S. Navy nuclear reactors assertion that nuclear explosion was possible it was not disputed by Mr. Remington nor by two senior HM inspectors of nuclear installation. Professor, Professor Jack Harris, FRS, F engineer, was a nuclear metal metallurgist involved in the design of British gas cooled reactors, supported Ross Heskiss position on the possibility of a nuclear explosion and nuclear reactor. Sir John Hill, when chairman of the Atomic Energy Authority in the UK, wrote in the House Journal of the Authority in 2012, when the Americans chose graphite moderated water-cooled pipes for plutonium production, they recognized that a failure of the water supply or control system could result in prompt criticality and a nuclear explosion such as happened 40 years later at Germany. Okay, so I'm not sure what that means. Does that mean that they knew it before they did it? Forty years later, it sounds to me like they knew. But anyway, night night, Bog. Thank you. It's a bit tight. Thank you for being here. And uh, this will be recorded. So, And you can go online to enenews.com. Check it out yourself. And do the research. Don't listen to what we say. Don't take our word for it. Go and do the research yourself. Thank you for listening. So that is pretty much the end of uh, my presentation on Fukushima. I don't really have much more to say. Um, there was one thing posted on Facebook. But there is a, a bit more positive information 
that I wanted to share and I always like to end on a really positive note. Aww. Okay, that would be cool, Donnie. And I'm, and I'm looking at a picture of my granddaughter on Facebook and I just love it. This is the reason why I do this, because of my family. Um, I don't like to have dead air either, but um, what I wanted to share was um, C. Seti also uh, posted on Facebook um, a little message about <laughs> like running for the hills or something. I'm not sure what I just I didn't want to like try to guess it, but it was uh, from C. Seti James Gillian status. So turning off all the radiation detectors to warn the people was a good idea. Who are they protecting? I'm not sure what that means. You are receiving this as part of your subscription to the email alert services of Turner Radio Network. Email is never sent unsolicited. If you no longer wish to receive your subscription, simply click on the link at the bottom. Newsflash, urgent. Steam suddenly emanating from Fukushima reactor number three. West coast of North America should begin preparations for possible radiation cloud within three to five days. Okay, if this was posted on the 20th, this we've already read, um, I'm not sure when the, um, it might have been on the 9th, so if, uh, I have to go back one uh, message here, so it must have been, this, which one was the steam, was the, the steam was the first one, December 27th, okay, that's the camera, and also the 25th and the 24th. So we're past three days, I guess, so um, if that were true, we'd all be sunk. But they're saying it's just across the Pacific Ocean. But, uh, you know, a lot of people think that this is contained to just the Northern Hemisphere, but it's not. Um, I believe from all the nuclear explosions, from the testing, what they did uh, in Nagasaki um, in World War II, uh, the depleted uranium in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and God knows where else, because I know they're using it everywhere. They're probably using it in Israel against the Palestinians and uh, all kinds of places. So uh, there's no place that's untouched by this, and uh, I, I don't know what else to say except. We are people of light, and our body has a way of healing itself. We manifest with our thoughts. As we get this information and share this information, I think it's also important that we understand that um, we really need to be aware of how powerful we are as human beings. Uh, we have the power to change our reality. And, uh, and I really think it's important that we be reminded of that. And that's not really going to be my show tonight, uh, the positive timeline. But it is going to be important as we move forward and talk about a very interesting whistleblower uh, who I have... Uh, found out as a result of David Wilcox's um, wisdom teachings on Gaim TV. Uh, he's up to episode 41, and I watch him religiously every Monday night, 7 o'clock, uh, in archives usually. We're going to listen to a pod from Edgar Fouché. He is really an unsung whistleblower for UFO technologies. And, um, He's one of the resources that David Wilcox used in, in his writing his books and his presentations. But most importantly, uh, he's uh, somebody whose name hardly ever comes up. And his information is much more uh, 
what do you call it? He has he has the credentials to prove what he says. Where other whistleblowers such as Dan Barish and other individuals don't have the, a fraction of the credentialing for working with um, dark projects, dark dark ops or black ops uh, projects in the military, as uh, Edgar Fouché has, and that's Edgar F O U C H E, and uh, I'm I'm kind of like a little bit torn. Should I? Uh, play the podcast first, which is almost two hours long, or read an article about oil, uh, which probably would be uh, much more appropriate. So we're going to take a little break, and then we're going to come back, and uh, we're going to we're going to read an alternative hypothesis for Ed's disclosures, and it's basically talking about big oil, and it's quite interesting. I didn't read the whole thing, but the little bit I read, I was like. I don't ha- I don't know all this information. Many people may have heard some of this stuff before, um, and I probably have too. But there's so much more in there, so um, I'm going to share this with everybody, and hopefully, uh, <laughs> here, uh, Anon, thank you for your post. And before we go for a break, I'm going to read: Japan is a secular country, and so it's likely that if it's true, the elites are religious not jobs, then we could assume that may be part of the reason for the attack disaster. Yeah, it's interesting. There was a lot of information put out by Fulford that kind of followed with um, they weren't doing what the cabal wanted them to, so they got knocked about a bit. But I think it goes a lot deeper to the, um, to the, the reason why the nuclear radiation is being Used and I, I and I want to go on a dimensional level, but I, I'm not that versed in that information. Does anybody wants to share about that? But I think I think you know there's a there's a physical uh, aspect to this. There's a spiritual aspect to this, and I think there's a dimensional. And when I say spiritual, I meant religion. But I think on a deeper level, a dimensional level. So. Um, not to separate them, but it has some effect on consciousness. Um, let me go to a break, and then we'll come back, and maybe I'll have my thoughts a little bit together, and I'll have a little, um, what do you call it, uh, some information from, the, from some knowledgeable individual <laughs> that will uh, be a little bit more concise than in my meanderings. So, uh, let me uh, set up the jingle and go back to this. So, thank you all for listening to wakeradio.co.uk pensionsisradio.com This is Chrissy Nick and you're listening to your Alcohol. See what's sending out them negative waves, did Moriarty? But oddball, I did try and tell them, but they won't listen. I tried. Sure. But I did. I did try. <sighs> oh, man. Don't hit me with them negative waves so early in the morning. But I can't force them to listen. I can't. Always with the negative waves, Moriarty. Always with the negative waves. Have a little faith, baby. Have a little faith. But I keep trying. Oddball, I keep trying. But they won't listen. They won't tune in. They really won't. Why don't you knock it off with them negative waves? Why don't you dig how beautiful it is out here? Why don't you say something righteous and hopeful for a change? Tune in to Awake Radio for your positive waves. You're listening to Shaziz Radio, where originality and original music never stop. Isn't that that mad scientist dude? Welcome to Awake Radio. Awake
And that was Bright Eyes, Road to Joy. I don't know about that, but um, that was the name of the song. This is Chrissy McMahon, and you're listening to Our Chemical Connections here on AwakeRadio.co.uk and Shizizradio.com. Thank you for listening. We were just talking about uh, Fukushima, the Daiichi nuclear power plant, being overseen and cared for lovingly by TEPCO. That would be Tokyo Energy and Power Company, or Electric and Power Company, I'm not sure which, but I think it's Energy. And uh, before I get into anything else, um, I have this really cool article about oil. Uh, it's Edgar Fouché's um, website, and it's called AlienScientist.com. And I would like to post it here. Let's see how that works. <laughs> the article I want. <laughs> what happened? Big oil from the monopoly men to the petrodollar recycling system. In May 73, with the dramatic fall of the dollar still vivid, a group of 84 of the world's top financial and political insiders met at Solstjöbaden, Sweden, the secluded island resort of the Swedish Wallenberg banking family. This gathering of the Bilderberg group heard an American participant Walter Levy outline a scenario for an imminent 400% increase in OPEC petroleum revenues. The purpose of the secret Salts Jobaden meeting was not to prevent the expected oil price shock, but rather to plan how to manage the about to be created flood of oil dollars, a process U.S. Secretary of State Kissinger called recycling the petrodollars flow. From F. William Engdahl. A Century of War, 2004, probably page 38. According to research outlined in Dr. David Spiro's book, The Hidden Hand of the American Hegemony, 1999, it was during this time, May 1973, during the first ever Bilderberg meeting, that OPEC began discussions on the viability of pricing oil trades in several currencies. This unpublished proposal involved a basket of currencies from the Group of Ten Nations, or G10. These ten members of the Bank of International Settlements, plus Australia, or Austria and Switzerland, included the major European countries and their currencies such as Germany, Mark, France, Franc, and the UK sterling, as well as other industrialized nations such as Japan, the Yen, Canada, the Canadian dollar, and of course the United States, the dollar. It should be noted the powerful G10 BIS Group of 10 also has one unofficial member, the governor of the Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority, or the SAMA. In order to prevent this monetary transition to a basket of currencies, the Nixon administration began high-level talks with Saudi Arabia to unilaterally price international oil sales in dollars only, despite U.S. assurances to its European and Japanese allies that such a unique monetary geopolitical arrangement would not transpire. In '74, an agreement was reached with New York and London banking interests, which established what became known as petrodollar recycling. That year, the Saudi government secretly purchased $2.5 billion in U.S. Treasury bills with their oil surplus funds, and a few years later, Treasury Secretary Michael... Blumenthal cut a secret deal with the Saudis to ensure that OPEC would continue to price oil in dollars only. In typical understatement, Dr. Shapiro noted clearly something more than the laws of supply and demand resulted in 70% of all Saudi assets in the United States being held in New York Fed account. Naturally, this arrangement with the Saudi government prevented a market-based adjustment and was the basis for a second phase of the American century, the petrodollar phase. What follows is an extraordinary history in which petrodollar recycling was vigorously implemented during the 70s. Beginning in the mid-70s, the American century system of global economic dominance underwent a dramatic change. The oil price shock of 73, 74, and 79 suddenly created enormous demand for the floating dollar. Oil-importing countries from Germany to Argentina to Japan all were faced 
with how to acquire export-based dollars to pay their expensive new oil import bills, the rise in the price of the oil-flooded OPEC with dollars that far exceeded domestic investment needs and were therefore categorized as surplus petrodollars. A major share of these oil dollars came to London and New York banks where the new process of monetary petrodollar recycling was initiated. Engdahl's remarkable book, A Century of War, 2004, chronicles how certain geopolitical events mirrored a scenario discussed during May 73 Bilderberg meeting. Apparently, powerful banking interests sought to manage the monetary dollar flows that were premised upon what the group envisioned as the huge increases in the price of oil from the Middle East. The minutes of this Bilderberg meeting included projections regarding the price of OPEC oil of some 400%. In 74, U.S. Assistant Treasury Secretary Jack F. Bennett and David Mulford of the London-based Eurobond firm of White, Weld & Co. set about the mechanism to handle the surplus OPEC petrodollars. 40, Kissinger, oh, that was on page 40, I guess, Kissinger, Bennett, and Mulford helped orchestrate the secret financial arrangement that the Saudi Arabia Monetary Agency, SAMA, that create, creatively transformed the high oil prices of 73-74 to the direct benefit of the U.S. Federal Reserve Banks and the Bank of England. Despite the financial windfall enjoyed by the U.S., U.K. banking and petroleum conglomerates who managed the recycling of petrodollar flows, most Americans regard the 7374 oil shocks as a particularly painful time period of high inflation, long lines at every gas station. In the third world, these high oil prices created huge loans for the international monetary fund debts to be repaid entirely in dollars. Now let's fast forward to more recent events. On September 24, 2000, Saddam Hussein emerged from a meeting of his government and proclaimed that Iraq would soon transition its oil export transactions to the Euro, Euro currency. Saddam referred to the U.S. dollar as currency of the enemy state. Why would Saddam's currency switch be such a strategic threat to the bankers in London and New York? Why would the United States president risk 50 years of carefully crafted global alliances with various European allies and advocate, and advocate a military attack whose justification could not be proved to the world community. The answer is s simple. The dollar's unique role of a petrodollar has been the foundation of the dollar's hegemony since the mid-70s. The process of petrodollar recycling underpins American economic hegemony which funds American military supremacy. Dollars, petrodollar supremacy allows the U.S. a unique ability to sustain, sustain yearly currency or yearly current account deficits, pass huge tax cuts, build a massive military empire of bases around the globe, and still have others accept our currency as medium of exchange for their imported goods and services. The origin of this history are not found in textbooks on international economics, but rather in the minutes of meetings held by various banking and petroleum elites who have quietly sought unhindered power. U.S. dollar, fiat currency, or oil-backed currency. What the powerful men grouped around the Bilderberg had evidently decided that May 1973 was to launch a colossal assault against industrial growth in the world in order to tilt the balance of power back to the advantage of Anglo-American financial interest in the dollar. In order to do this, they determined to use their most prized weapon for control of the world's oil flows. Bilderberg's policy was to trigger a global oil embargo in order to enforce a dramatic increase in world oil prices. Since 1945, world oil had by international custom been priced in dollars. A sudden sharp increase in the world price of oil, therefore, meant an equally dramatic increase in world demand for U.S. dollars to pay for that necessary oil. 
Never in history has such a small circle of interest centered in London and New York controlled so much of the entire world economic destiny. The Anglo-American financial establishment had resolved to use their oil power in a matter no one could have imagined possible. The very outrageousness of their scheme was to their advantage. They clearly reckoned. F. William Engdahl, A Century of War, 2004. At this point, he makes an extraordinary claim. I am 100% sure that the Americans were behind the increase in the price of oil. The oil companies were in real trouble at the time. They had borrowed a lot of money, and they needed a high oil price to save them. He says he was convinced of this by the attitude of the Shah of Iran, who in one critical day in 1974 moved from the Saudi view to advocating higher prices. King Fissal sent me to the Shah of Iran who said, Why are you against the increase of the price of oil? That is what they want. Ask Henry Kissinger. He is the one who wants the higher price. Yamani contended that proof of his long-held belief had recently emerged in the minutes of secret meetings on the Swedish island in 1973 where UK and US officials determined to orchestrate a 400% increase in oil price. UK Observer interview with Sheikh Yaki Yamani, Saudi Arabian oil minister from 62 to 86 at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, January 14, 2001. As previously noted, the crucial shift to an oil-backed currency took place in the early 70s when President Nixon closed the so-called gold window at the Federal Treasury. This removed the dollar's redemption value from a fixed amount of gold to a fiat currency that floated against other currency. This was done so the federal government would have no restraint on printing new dollars, thereby able to pursue undisciplined fiscal policies to maintain the U.S. superpower status. The only limit was how many dollars the rest of the world would be willing to accept on the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. The result was rapid inflation and a, a falling dollar. Although rarely discussed outside arcane discussions of the global political economy, it is easy to grasp that if the oil can be purchased on the international market, markets only with U.S. dollars, the demand and liquidity value will be solidified given that oil is the essential natural resources required for every industrialized nation. Oil trades are the basic enablers for a manufacturing infrastructure. The basis of global transportation and the primary energy source for 40% of the industrial economy. 40%, I would imagine it might be a little bit higher than that, but that's what this says. During the 1970s, a two-pronged strategy was pursued by the U.S. U.K. banking elites to exploit the unique role of oil in an effort to maintain dollar hege hegemony. One component was the requirement that OPEC agree to price and conduct all of its oil transactions in the dollar only. The two ways to use these surplus petrodollars as an instrument to dramatically reverse the dollar's falling liquidity value via high oil prices. The net effect solidified industrialized and developing nations under the sphere of the dollar. No longer backed by gold, the dollar became backed by black gold. This brilliant, if somewhat nefarious act of monetary jujitsu enormously benefited not only the U.S.-U.K. banking interest, but also the seven sisters of the U.S.-U.K. petroleum conglomerate, Exxon, Texaco, Mobil, Chevron, Gulf, British Petroleum, and Royal Dutch Shell. These major oil interests had incurred tremendous debts from the capital requirements in their large new oil platforms, in the inhospitable areas of the North Sea and Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. However, following the 74 oil price shocks, their profitability was secure. Engdahl candidly noted, while Kissinger's 73 oil shock had a devastating impact on world industrial growth, it had an enormous benefit for certain established interests. The major New York and London banks and seven sister oil multinationals 
of the United States and Britain. The unique monetary arrangement was formalized in June 74 by Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, establishing the U.S.-Saudi Arabian Joint Commission on Economic Cooperation. The U.S. Treasury and the New York Federal Reserve would allow the Saudi central banks to buy U.S. Treasury bonds with Saudi petroleum. Likewise, London banks would handle Eurozone-based international oil transactions loan these revenue via euro bonds to oil importing countries. The debt and interest from these loans would then flow to the dollar dom dominated payments to the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, thereby completing the recycling of surplus petrodollars back to the Federal Reserve. As for Saddam's switch to, that led to regime change. <clears throat> Although this little noted Iraq move to defy the dollar in favor of the euro in itself did not have a huge impact, the ramifications regarding further OPEC momentum towards a petro euro are quite profound. If invoicing oils and euros were to spread, especially against an already weak dollar, it could create a panic sell off of dollars by foreign central banks and OPEC oil producers. In the months before the latest Iraq war, hints in this direction were heard from Russia, Iran, Indonesia, and even Venezuela. They were indicators that the Iraq war was a forceful way to deliver a message to OPEC and other oil producers. Do not transition from the petrodollar to the petro-euro system. Engdahl's conversation with a forthright London-based banker is rather enlightening. In foreign banking circles in the City of London and elsewhere in Europe privately confirmed the significance of that little noted Iraq move from petrodollar to petro euro. The Iraq move was a declaration of war against the dollar, one senior London banker told me recently. As soon as it was clear that British and US had taken Iraq, a great sigh of relief was heard in London City banks. They had privately now we don't have to worry about the damn euro threat. Petrodollar recycling works quite simply because oil is an essential commodity for every nation and the petrodollar system demands the buildup of huge trade surpluses in order to accumulate dollar surplus. This is the case for every country but the United States which controls the dollar and prints it at will or fiat. Because today the majority of all international trade is done in dollars, other countries must engage in active trade relations with the U.S. to get the means of payment they cannot themselves issue. The entire global trade structure today has formed around this dynamic from Russia to China, from Brazil to South Korea and Japan. Every nation aims to maximize dollar surpluses from their export trade as almost every nation needs to import oil. This ensures the dollar's liquidity value and helps explain why most 70% of the world trade is conducted in dollars. Even though U.S. exports are about one-third of that total, the dollar is the currency which central banks accumulate as reserves. But whether it's China, Japan, Brazil, or Russia, they simply do not stack all these dollars in their vaults. Currencies have one advantage over gold. A central bank can use it to buy the state bond of the issuer, the United States. Most countries around the world are forced to control trade deficits or face currency collapse. Such is not the case in the United States, whose number one export product is the dollar itself. This unique arrangement is largely due to the dollar's world reserve currency role, which is underpinned by its petrodollar role. Every nation needs to get dollars to purchase oil, some more than others. This means their trade targets are countries that utilize the dollar. With the U.S. consumer as the main target for export products of the nation seeking to build their dollar reserves. And uh, the references here are David E. Shapiro, The Hidden Hand of American Hegemony, Petrodollar Recycling in International Markets, Cornell University Press, 1991. David E. Shapiro, William Engdahl, A Century of War, Anglo-American Oil Politics in the New World, World Order, Pluto Press, 2004, 2nd edition. 
William Engdahl, A Century of War, pages 130 to 138, note Engdahl was able to purchase the secret minutes of the May 73 Bilderberg meeting from a Paris bookseller. His book contains actual photocopies of the cover page and related text discussion in Chapter 1. The cover page is stamped Salj Jabadin Conference, 11th to the 13th of May, 1973, also stamped on the cover pages are the word personal and strictly confidential and not for publication either in whole or in part. William Engdahl, A Century of War, op cited, page 135. Oliver Morgan and Islam Fisal, Saudi drove in the oil slick. Observer, January 14, 2001. Robert Block, Some Muslim Nations Advocate Dumping the Dollar for the Euro, The Wall Street Journal, April 15, 2003. And William Engdahl, A New American Century, Iraq and the Hidden Euro Dollar Wars, Current Concerns, Chapter Number 4, 2013. And there is a video here, so um, Oil, Smoke, and Mirrors, um, which I have made a copy of, and I'll be happy to post that, and a prize. A History of Oil, Money, and Power. And I think um, the next two are uh, little short videos. So uh, while we're getting ready to go to another break, I'm going to uh, set up here a couple. Um, I thought I had made a copy of these other two uh, pods. So we'll just go to the jingle, and I will be right back. You're listening to Awake Radio. .co.uk and shizizradio.com. This is You're listening to Shiziz Radio with the widest variety of original music types anywhere in the world, 24-7, all, all day, day, all, all night. night. You're listening to Awake Radio, straight talk to the awake and aware. You're listening to Chrissy McMahon on awakeradio.co.uk. Sorry for the pause. That was supposed to be a six-minute song, so maybe I was fumbling for six minutes. I doubt it. But anyway, uh, we're back on air, and we're going to go into our uh, individual of the evening, which would be Edgar Fouché. Um, The first uh, pod that we're going to listen to is called uh, Alien Rapture. It's a 1998 presentation by Edgar Fouché, F-O-U-C-H-E. And um, I th- believe he will uh, introduce himself, so you'll, you'll get the gist of uh, his background. And um, there's no wiki page for him, or Wikipedia page. Um, he's so unsung. <laughs> he's debunked more than anything. And I guess that's because his credentials are just 100% real. So um, we're going to start right away with Edgar Fouché, Alien Rapture. This is a presentation from 1998. And uh, just to give a heads up, uh, we just read from his website, Alien Scientist, Rational Analysis of Classified Science and Technology. And this is uh, Edgar Fouché's website at alienscientist.com. And we read from Big Oil, uh, the Big Oil link. Uh, Check out his website. And here, without further ado, we have Edgar Fouché, UFA, UFA, yeah, UFO whistleblower extraordinary air that you've never heard of. 